Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next lecture of Intro to Theater. What we're going to be doing during this lecture and the next two is looking at modern theater. And by modern theater, I'm referring to theater since 1850. During these three lectures, we're going to be concentrating on essentially 150 years. We're going to look at about 1850 to 2000 and the development of theater during this time period. What you should keep in mind is that during these 150 years, theater changed greatly. Uh, it, in many instances, it, it was changing every couple of years. As world events were beginning to have a greater impact on what occurred internationally, the artistic uh, side of, of society, of culture, responded. And what we should keep in mind with that is that as the world seemed to get smaller and more interconnected, it became easier, of course, as you know, to communicate. Uh, travel, of course, became faster. Uh, countries became more interdependent. And as a result, we see art changing and of course theater changes along with that and so during this period we have what are referred to as isms a lot of different isms from realism to naturalism symbolism futurism dadaism expressionism impressionism all of these isms come into play now we're only going to be focusing today on realism in our next lectures, we'll take a look at several of these other forms. So let's begin by talking about the modern theater divisions and looking at it really since 1875. There are essentially five areas in which we can take theater and divide it. We have realism, the departures from realism, eclecticism, which is putting different things together, the continuing of, of course, traditional and popular theater of the past, and then globalization. Now, the reason we have essentially these five divisions is because approximately around 1870, 1875, realism, especially in theater, erupted, comes to the forefront, and dominates much of theater, even still to today much of the theater that we experience today, and, and I would like to classify here, I'm talking plays rather than musicals, uh, because musicals are not exactly the most realistic experience. All of a sudden you, you break out into song and dance. But if we're talking about plays, even much of the theater we experience today, much of the ticket-selling theater that audiences attend, is realistic in nature, whether it is about the plot, the types of characters, the setting, uh, the, the concept that's being presented. There's a lot of realism present. So realism is still evident today, although it's not as distinct as it was, let's say, 1875 to about 1960. The departures from realism, then, are those various isms I mentioned earlier. Naturalism, symbolism, expressionism, impressionism, futurism, dadaism. Um, when we look at these, and those are only a few examples, these were attempts by artists, and in particular theatrical artists, uh, along with what we might see in uh, painting and sculpture, as attempts to move beyond what was real. Since realism is a depiction of what we experience in our everyday lives, sometimes in art what we have to, have to do, or, or maybe it, it's better to say what we want to do, is to escape from our everyday lives. So these departures from realism were an opportunity to explore an artistic voice or an artistic venue or, or idea that, that pushed forward thinking 
that was not about what we experience each day. Eclecticism then becomes combining several of these ideas and putting these ideas together. So perhaps maybe you have someone who takes the concept of expressionism and combines that with modernism or takes futurism and at the same time attempts to combine that with Dadaism, although that combination would never work because of the nature of Dada, uh, which is not this lecture, but is a future lecture. That fourth division then of continuing traditional and popular theater of the past is about still presenting on stage Shakespeare or um, Marlowe or Moliere or Lope de Vega or still presenting on stage Sophocles or Aeschylus still bringing these plays to the stage, still bringing, for example, the second shepherd's play to the stage, which we've talked about, or bringing every man to the stage. Those plays are examples of what was traditional and popular theater of the past. Reconstruction plays, definitely reconstruction plays. And in fact, all of those still are performed often today. In fact, it's probably a fair statement to say that many high school theaters and many university theaters still try to, if not every year, every other year, perform something that is of that traditional or popular theater of the past, what they might call classical theater, in an effort to give their students the opportunity to do that type of theater. And then, of course, we have globalization, which is when we allow artistic influences from around the world. So I've mentioned, I think, previously that I directed a play once in a kabuki style. Um, so that was bringing that style to a play that was written in that format and attempting to teach students that I had about that experience and get them to experience, to, to, to learn a different theater method. It's not just that, however, when we talk about globalization, it's, it's also about looking at performance studies and looking at different ways in which performance occurs globally whether it be in different cultures, different countries, cities, uh, and, and in different ways in which we can experience something that is theatrical. So let's begin by talking about a little bit of history. Your discussion prompt this week is asking you to take a look at history. And I'm a firm believer that when we are considering what occurs, especially from 1850 to the present day, that art is highly influenced by the historical events of the time. If we take, for example, this year alone, we know that, that um, the events of this year are greatly impacting our ability to be able to experience art, whether that's concerts or movies or theater or something new of that nature. At the same time, Artists who are stuck at home are finding that they are experiencing a creative resurgence because they're being influenced by current events. And the art they are attempting to create, they want to disseminate to, to us as receivers to embolden us to, to, to push forward. So here uh, I found online this chart, and th this just represents major events. If we were in class together, we would come up with as many different international events as we could collaboratively, and I'd write them on, on the board, and we would put them in, into some type of chronicle, chronological order. So if we start about 1850, that's this line right here. 
That means that we're in the Victorian era and it's the beginning of the Romantic era. And that's why we're starting in 1850. It is generally accepted that Romanticism begins around 1850. I think you should take note it, over here, even though we're not talking about the, the Georgian era, that for good or bad, right or wrong, in Western society and culture, and I am talking about Europe and then North America, much of history is defined by British monarchs. The Georgian era, the Victorian era, and then, of course, the Edwardian period. All three British monarchs. So we're looking at, at 1850. We're in the Victorian era. Romanticism begins, followed by the Gilded Age, which is a, a change, again, in artistic movements. That then is followed or uh, occurs about the same time as the Meiji period, but is then followed shortly by the Edwardian period, the Edwardian period uh, being a very short time. We then move into a progressive area where we see the progressive area starting uh, shortly before 1875. So this is after the Civil War in the United States. This is during Reconstruction in the United States. The progressive area is when we start seeing technology come into play around the world and things are moving forward. And so then that ended up leading to, of course, the machine age, which then led to the oil age in 1900. And so that's where we see moguls such as um, the Standard Oil Company having a lot of global power. And in many respects, we, we still are experiencing that today, um, the, the oil age, because this still goes up until the 2000s. We are completely and totally dependent upon petroleum products. We have World War I, the interwar period, and World War II. And I can tell you that between these 40 years, art evolved drastically so many different artistic movements there was just a a burst of artistic energy even as a result of these wars in many instances following world war ii we ended up in the atomic age which we are still in we have the cold war of course which ended in the 1990s i remember that very well the space age, which of course we are still in, and now the space age is even, of course, evolving to not necessarily being government sponsored, but publicly sponsored. The postmodern age, which is one of the periods that is probably the most difficult to define artistically because we're currently in it. And so because we're currently in a postmodern age, it's difficult to look at that objectively and attempt to understand what's going on. That begins in the mid-70s, uh, early to mid-70s. And then, of course, the information age. We are still very much a part of the information age. And if we look at how things have changed, we hold in our hand a, a phone that does what 50 years ago, a large room full of electronic devices would have attempted to do and would not have done it as quickly or as simply. So we are very much in the information age. And there are specific events that occurred globally within all of these ages. So I've just broken down the periods, the ages, and your discussion prompt is much more specific about what you're supposed to do. So we're going to concentrate in this lecture on the concept of realism. It's our first ism. And I want you to get used to that, that term, ism. And it's our first ism, sort of. And I say sort of because it's the first one we are really going to focus on. Chronologically, however, it's not the first ism. In the artistic movement of realism, theatrically, everything that occurs on stage whether it's costuming, it's 
lighting, it's scenic, definitely the characters and the story, the plot, was made to resemble what was observable in life. And so what was put on stage could not be something that we as receivers could not go out into our everyday lives or out into the world and be able to see your experience. And so as a result, as audience members, as receivers, we experienced recognition and identification with what occurred on stage, whether that's recognition, identification with the scenery and the props or the costumes, but more importantly, with the stories, the stories and the plots and the characters. So we see actors speaking the way we speak. We see them dressing the way we dress. We see scenic and living environments that were like what we live in. And we see characters behaving the way we behave. So as receivers, in the period of realism, it was important for us to be able to relate to what we observe. Songs, like in a musical. Supernatural characters, like what we see with the blind seer of Tresius and Antigone, or any of the Greek gods. Poetry as we see in Shakespeare, fantasies, um, dream sequences. Those are all things that we cannot observe in real life. I mean, let, let's face it. I would suspect, although <laughs> you are university students, that most of us don't have a... a a point in, in our lives where all of a sudden everyone we are with just automatically breaks out into song and dance that pushes the story forward of what we're doing at that point in time. Now, granted, um, I was your age once. I was in university. Maybe you guys do. All of a sudden you're with a group of friends and you do break out into song and dance. Two thumbs up for you if you do. Is that realistic? Is that something that's really observable in everyday life and recognized and identified by all of us? No. Um, we definitely don't have dream sequences. We don't um, uh, talk in, in poetic fashion all the time. Okay. Those are things that we don't observe and easily relate to. So those depart from realism theatrically. Now, realism begins in Europe, and more specifically begins in France by August Comte. Comte had a philosophy of positivism, in which he creates a hierarchy of all of the science and takes sociology as being the highest of the sciences. I, I presume that most of you have probably heard about at some point in time Maslow's hierarchy of uh, self-actualization experiences. Well, think of this as Comte having a hierarchy in science. And the, the highest, the most important was sociology because that becomes a study and investigation of us, of human nature, of society, of people. And there could not be anything higher, more honorable, more important, more significant. In other words, within science, we can study all these other things, but all of these other things ultimately move towards studying the organism that is society. The aim of realism was betterment of the human condition. If we can take a look at and observe something on stage, and as a result, better ourselves from it, whether that's our current status, our current state, uh, but more importantly, our understanding of ourselves, that was significant and important. 
Second, all sciences, according to Kant, were working to predict or to control human behavior. And I want you to realize that's two separate things. It wasn't that science wanted to do one or the other. They wanted or, or necessarily wanted to do both. It's more about doing kind of like one or the other. Can we predict human behavior or can we control human behavior? And if we think about it, and I have a science background. I've told you I have a science background. I used to teach advanced physics. Every type of science could be classified as either predicting behavior or controlling behavior, whether that's human or otherwise. The third idea behind realism, according to Comte, was that art itself should be scientific. Because art is going to predict, whoops, that's my phone. Sorry about that, guys. Um, art is going to predict or attempt to control human behavior. Art is going to attempt to better the human condition. So in that essence, art is, is scientific. So then here are four things to keep in mind. Art itself must depict truthfully the physical world in which we exist. If it doesn't represent the world truthfully, then that's not real and it's not realism. Once we understand that is going to depict things truthfully, we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we arrive at that truth? And that's number two. Truth is found through direct observation. Hearsay is not important. Hearsay is not allowed. If I cannot directly observe something, if I am not a witness to it, then how can there be truth in it? Now, that doesn't mean that I can be a witness to it and tell someone else. That's possible. So I can witness, I can directly observe, and then communicate that truth. And that's what we should do. And if we're going to make direct observations, we need to realize, number three, only what is contemporary can be observed. When all of us were younger and, and we were in elementary school, we probably had a unit on dinosaurs. And perhaps at that point, all of us thought for a few minutes that we would love to be an archaeologist and dig up a dinosaur. I know I, I had that, that concept, that idea. As I look back on it now, I realize that being an archaeologist or being an anthropologist or even a historian is an extremely difficult task because you are constantly unearthing the past and trying to look at it and trying to make discernments about it and in some instances, you probably probably don't know whether your judgments are true or not. But in, in terms of what's contemporary, what's now, we can make, every one of us, regardless of, of who we are, we can make truthful observations about what's going on around us. Whether we report that truth is something different. Because that leads to the, the fourth point here, is that first we're talking about, number one, art has to depict the world truthfully. And that that truth, then, number two, is found through observation. And that number three, that observation can only occur based upon looking at what is contemporary, not what's in the future, not what's in the past. And so as a result, art must be objective. 
which means it's okay if the end of the story <clears throat> is not happy. Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. It's not realistic. It's poetic. But it doesn't have a happy ending. And if we look at what's real, much of life doesn't have happy endings in various events. So while Romeo and Juliet is not realism, the idea that something doesn't have to have a happy ending is real. And so we can take that idea of tragedy and create dramatic realism by saying, all right, let's look at these unhappy endings and apply that specifically to social problems. And so that's what realism then did. It became about looking at societal issues and objectively bringing that to the stage, which meant that artists had to be like scientists. So here are four characteristics then of realism. Number one, realism, and to be a realistic play, the plot had to, in many ways, or at least one way, be focused on some type of social concern. And even though it's focused on a social concern, ultimately there has to be, number two, a positive outlook on society and on life itself. Because it's about social concerns, and because it wants to take a positive outlook on society and life, it's, in other words, it's, it's trying to find the good. Is there good present? And where is that present? No matter how small it is, where is it? It then is anti-authoritarian, which means that typically you might have the protagonist or some other character, but oftentimes it's the protagonist in, in the realistic story who is struggling against some form of repression. Because if the story is going to be about a social concern, then that must mean that there is repression in some way, shape, or form that is holding something in society back. Which then gives us our fourth and final characteristic. That realism is anti-destiny. Where the Greeks were about destiny, realism allows for the characters to grow and to change. And it's in that idea that it is oftentimes, I think, simpler to determine the climax of a story. Remember, a climax of a story occurs when there is a character who experiences recognition and reversal. Well, recognition and reversal means that there's you're changing, you're growing. So to be anti-destiny to suggest that change can occur and, and that you can grow means, first of all, you need to recognize that change can occur and you can grow. And then you need to reverse your path so that you do change and do grow. So let's talk about some realism playwrights. Henrik Ibsen is considered to be the founder, the father of modern realism. He lived 1828 to 1906. Ibsen is probably one of the most well-known of all realism playwrights. Early in his career, he wrote romantic dramas and abstract symbolism. But later on, he moved to realism. So, if Romanticism, the Romantic era, begins around 1850, then what we should realize is that Ibsen is writing first the beginning of the Romantic era. Symbolism is one of those isms that comes along. And he writes in that vein 
as well, abstract symbolism, before then settling on realism. And in doing so, he recognizes and writes dramas that represent everyday life. And the subject matter of his dramas was the fact that dramas should discuss, discuss issues that previously the public avoided. Okay? I want you to think about uh, what we've talked about before in, in saying, for example, that there are very conservative societies, the Puritans who came over, the Pilgrims who came over um, and settled in New England. Very conservative, um, ultra strict societies. So as a result, of course, there are topics that you don't discuss in everyday life. Ibsen is saying, we're not only going to discuss them, we're going to put it on stage for everyone to see. We're going to talk about economic injustice. We're going to talk about the, the sexual double standard between men and women. We're going to talk about unhappy marriages. We're going to talk about venereal disease. We're going to talk about religious hypocrisy. Now, I want you to think about this. He's putting those topics on stage in the late 19th century. So, of course, he's censored. Of course, there's opposition. Even today, I want you to think about these topics. And to what extent are these topics easy for people to talk about in everyday life? To, to what extent do we have these conversations? Do we have them more now than we did 100 years ago? More now than we did 50 years ago? Of course we do. But for many people, this is still really difficult, talking about these things. Now, Ibsen is most well known for these, these three plays, A Doll's House, Hedda Gabler, and Ghosts, among many others. I'm going to show you some clips of these. Um, I'm going to show you a clip of, of A Doll's House. Now, A Doll's House is about a husband and wife, but primarily it's a story about the wife, Nora, who is married and is raising her children with her husband and begins to realize that as a woman she has lived a life that is nothing more than being a plaything being a doll that either her father manipulated and played around with and kept in the house or her husband and while her husband maybe is not as bad as what her father was, she herself has never truly made decisions on her own. We're going to watch an, an ending section of that. Um, I was going to show you a clip of Hedda Gabler with Kate Blanchett, uh, but I don't think we're going to have time for that in order to get to the rest of this lecture. But I would suggest you look up Hedda Gabler on YouTube, Kate Blanchett. Uh, she played the title role of, of Hedda. Um, and Hedda is a woman who thinks she's moving in one direction and is dealing with the men in her life. And there are quite a few of them, for good or for bad. Um, she tries to control them. And ultimately, she ends up making decisions for herself. Um, just like Nora does in Doll's House. So let's take a look at A Doll House by Henrik Ibsen. It's the final scene of A Doll's House. And then we're going to discuss it a little bit because I, I, I want to bring up some ideas that Something might be surprising to you. I have to bring myself up. And you're not the man to do that for me. I have to do that on my own. That's why I'm leaving you now. What did you say? I have to be on my own if I am to get to understand myself and everything. 
going outside. That's why I can't stay here any longer. No, you are right. I'm leaving straight away. I'm sure Christina will put me up for the night. Oh, this is madness. You're, 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 you're out of your mind. I won't let you. I forbid it. It's no use you forbidding me anything anymore. I'll take what belongs to me. I don't want anything of yours. Either now or later. This is madness. Tomorrow I'll go home, to my old hometown, I mean. It should be easier for me to find something to do there. Oh, you poor blind, inexperienced creature. I must see that I get some experience, Torvald. But you're leaving your home, your husband, and your children. And haven't you thought what people will say? I can't think about that. I only know that it's necessary for me. This is outrageous. You're betraying your most sacred duty. What do you consider my most sacred duty to be? Do I have to tell you? It's your duty to your husband and your children. I have another duty, just as sacred. You have not. But what could that be? My duty to myself. First and foremost, you are a wife and mother. I don't believe that any longer. I believe that first and foremost, I am a human being, just as you are. Or at least that I must try to become one. Oh, I know that most people will say that you're right, Torvald, and that it says something like that in all the books. But I can't go on accepting what people say and what it says in books. I have to think things out for myself so that I'll get to understand them. But don't you understand that your place is in the home? I mean, don't you have something you can rely on for guidance in these matters? Religion? Torvald, I don't really know at all what religion is. What are you saying? Well... I don't know anything except what Pastor Hansen told me when I was being confirmed. He said that religion was this and that and the other. When I get away from all this and on my own, I'm going to have to look into that as well. I must find out whether it was right what Pastor Hansen said, or rather, whether it was right for me. If you, if you haven't got your religion to guide you, then let me stir your, your conscience. I mean, you must have some moral sense, haven't you? Or perhaps you haven't answered me that. Well, it isn't very easy to answer you that, Torvald, because I just don't know. I really don't know what I think about all that. All I do know is that you and I think quite differently about things like that. And now I'm told that the law is quite different from what I thought, but I simply can't get it into my head that the law can be right, that a woman doesn't have the right to spare her old and dying father or to save her husband's life. I simply don't believe that. Oh, you think I talk like a child. You don't understand the society you live in. No. No, I don't. But now I'm going to find out about it. I must find out who's right. Society or me. You're ill. Laura, you're feverish. You're out of your mind. I've never felt so clear. So certain. As I do tonight. And you're leaving your husband and your children when you feel so clear and so certain. Yes, I am. There's only one possible explanation. What's that? You don't love me. Ah, oh, such a powerful scene. Um, several things. First of all, this is the end of the 19th century when Ibsen gives us this play. And at the end of it, we realize Nora and her husband Torvald are on different paths. And Torvald very much wants to follow society. Because he doesn't know anything else. And, and that's, I would say, no fault of his own. That's what society was at that point in time. But Nora is realizing that not only does she have a voice, but it's time for her to use her voice. And I want you to imagine it's the end of the 19th century. How strong a woman had to be. And, and they were financially fine. To leave her husband. 
and to leave her children to want nothing beyond what, what she truly needs and is going to go out and attempt to be on her own, to discover the world, to learn what she doesn't know. And Torvald asks in the middle of all that uh, what I think is a great question and is one of the most well-known questions in, I would say, all of theatrical plays is, don't you know what your sacred duty is it's to your husband and your children? And she says, no, I have another sacred duty. And, and he can't imagine in a marriage what could potentially be another sacred duty other than sacred duties to the family itself. And she says she has a sacred duty to herself. Mind-blowing for the end of the 19th century. Ibsen gives this female character not just dialogue, but a voice that had never been on stage before. Talk about looking at the sexual double standard of men and women. Talk about looking at unhappy marriages. And it, it, it's not that within that play that Torvald and, and Nora are exceptionally unhappy. It's, their marriage wasn't necessarily any different from anyone else's. I want you to realize that in all of society, all, in all of culture, throughout the entire world, throughout all of history, the idea of marrying for love is relatively new. Because regardless of what culture you looked at, you didn't marry for love, but you typically were marrying about moving up in society. And in fact, much of that still occurs today where you have matchmakers in some cultures and who are, are getting people together in, in, in order to, and comparing what each person can bring to a potential marriage. Or um, there are some cultures where the idea of parents setting up blind dates for their children still in their 30s in order to marry them off is very significant and important. Um, I'm sure most of us couldn't imagine being in 30s or 40s and our parents setting us up on blind dates. So this play was revolutionary with what Ibsen was doing and putting out there. Another realistic playwright is August Strindberg. He lived 1849 to 1912. He took the concept of realism even further than, than Ibsen did. Um, he concentrated on people who were at war with themselves and with others. And typically his characters suffered some type of mental anguish, neurosis, anxiety. Within his plays, the men and the women compete and attempt to dominate each other all the time. And I'm going to show you a trailer for Miss Julie. Uh, Miss Julie is a play of his that has been made several different times over into films. Uh, I don't know if Netflix still has one, but Netflix used to have a version of Miss Julie um, with Colin Farrell in it. Um, this is a, a three-character play. Typically, it takes place in a kitchen. And it's about a woman, Miss Julie, one of her servants, a uh, man, and another man who attempts to court her. And about the sexual dominance she ends up exerting throughout the course of the play 
over both men based upon what has occurred to her sexually in her youth. So let's take a look at a trailer for one of these examples, one of the, the film examples. Your very soul stinks. Wash it then. How dare you? Servant. A dog can sit on a countess's sofa. A horse can be caressed by a young lady's hand. But a servant? You can come and dance with me again. I wish to dance with someone who can leave because I do not wish to look ridiculous. And don't worry, Christine. I won't take your fiancé away from you. Very gracious running away from your partner like that. I was running back to the partner I'd left behind. Kiss my shoe. You hate men, don't you? Yes, most of the time, but then sometimes when I'm weak. Oh my god. It's dangerous to play with fire. I suppose you think you're irresistible, don't you? Say you love me. It made fools of ourselves once. Let's not do it again. What if I were to command you? Then I would have to obey, ma'am. Then I command you. Do you think, Julie, that a housemaid would behave towards a man the way you have? Have you ever, Julie, seen any woman of my class behave the way you have today? If you're thinking of tricking him into running away, I'll soon put a stop to him. I can feel the heat from you. So what do we do now? We enjoy each other. Look at me. I would like to know where you're going. You think I can't stand the sight of blood? I'd love to see the whole of your sex swimming in a lake of blood. You think I love you? Because my womb desired your seed. You think I want to carry your offspring under my heart and nourish it with my blood? Bear your child and take your name. I've never even heard your surname. Miss Julie. Okay, I think you can see that it's there's complete domination there. You have Miss Julie, you have her servant, who is supposed to be engaged to another woman, and they just go at it with innuendo and tension and sex and, and, and domination. And the, the anxiety and the neuroses you can see coming out there uh, towards the end of that trailer where she's just like, do you think I want to raise your child? That I wanted that? That I would want it at all? Because she realizes that maybe ultimately in the end, he isn't going to choose her. And it's not that she wanted him to. It's that she wanted to be able to potentially reject him. So much power there. Oh, uh, then let's look at Russia. Okay, so we have Strindberg and, and Ibsen, who are, you know, Norwegian, um, uh, essentially that area. So now we're going to go to Russia with Anton Chekhov. 1860, 1904. Not as long a life. He had much larger casts in his plays compared to Ibsen or Strindberg. 12 to 14 characters. The stories are always completely overlapping. Chekhov thought he was writing comedies. And then Stanislavski, his good friend and director for many of his plays, would say, are you kidding me? You wrote a tragedy. This is serious. This isn't comedic. And so that blending ended up developing the tragic comedy. He's known for The Cherry Orchard, The Three Sisters, Uncle Vanya, The Seagull. These plays are done all the time, still, today. So let's take a look at an example of The Cherry Orchard. This is about a Russian family that is essentially struggling financially and realizes that they're probably going to have to sell their, their famed cherry orchard in order to... Um, recoup any money 
and it's either sell that or essentially sell off one of the daughters and let her get married. This beautiful orchard, our beautiful orchard, after how many stormy autumns every year gripped by winter, my orchard is always young again, full of happiness and life. whatever you want, but know this. Come August 22nd, this whole place will be up for sale, unless you can find the money to pay for your debts. So decide, decide. You all decide. But I have my plan, and I can't see another way out. Where are the schools? The libraries? Where's all the money going? Hmm? On roads? This wealth from industry and enterprise, where is it all going? Okay, so that's a trailer for the National Theater when they uh, did that production several years ago. Um, it's you can see that that Chekhov within that is playing off of the economic hardship that's occurring in Russia at the time, and not only is he playing off of that in the story, but he is bringing forth. Much of the the ideas we talked about were centered on on realism, um, of economic challenges and difficulties, of what's going on within the world around you. Now, realistic theater was very controversial. As a result of that, you had to have independent subscription theaters to produce these plays. So by independent theaters, that means theaters that were not connected in any way to the governments with any type of sponsorship. So in Paris, we have the Theatre Libre. In uh, Germany, uh, we have the German theater, Theater Bühne. And in London, we have the Independent Theater. Of course, the, we have the Moscow Art Theater, the MAT, which is still a training institute today in Moscow, uh, as probably the most influential, most well-known late 19th, 20th century theater. Stanislavski was one of the founders, along with Vladimir Dachenko. And hopefully you remember that we talked about Stanislavski earlier in the semester when we talked about acting. Um, similar theaters occurred here in the United States, such as the Neighborhood Playhouse and the Provincet Provincetown Playhouse, both in New England. These were theaters that were putting realistic stories on stage that were, that were too controversial to have been put on by the public. Okay. You had an independent subscription theater. People paid a subscription to be a part of the theater, a, a membership, and to get season tickets. And so that's how they funded what they were doing. So with that, that brings us to the end of our discussion about realism. And in our next two lectures, we're going to continue to look at the other isms in theater. So take care, everyone. I hope you're having a good day.